in this section, we're going to talk about how you can uh, sort of alter the activity of enzymes. So the, the specific, ex well, the general example that I'm going to talk about is that some enzymes can have uh, small molecules, uh, small relative to an enzyme, that are what I would call anti-helpers. Uh, the more formal name for that is that there, there are small molecules that can inhibit or basically turn off or turn down enzymes. Now, what do I mean by that? Imagine we have this particular enzyme here, and it has this active site. It has this little divot here that can snugly attach to the substrate. And when the substrate attaches, it turns into product. Um, imagine that uh, in some instance, this particular enzyme goes haywire, and it starts basically taking substrate and making too much product. It, it's catalyzing this reaction too often. Now, this actually happens in a lot of biological systems. Excuse me about that. I'm backtracking a little bit. This actually happens. Sometimes enzymes do go haywire. Uh, one of the examples is the proton pump inhibitors that we talked about in earlier lectures. If they pump too much acid into the interior of your stomach, some of it can bubble up and, um, and go into your esophagus and cause heartburn. Another example of that is there is a particular enzyme in your body called COX-2. You don't need to know the details of this, but it makes a relatively interesting story. I'm not going to go into the details of the chemical reaction that COX-2 catalyzes, but suffice it to say that co the COX-2 enzyme, and pretend it's this one, can take some substrate and convert it into a product that gives people the sensation of pain. So. Um, if the COX-2 enzyme is functioning properly, every once in a while it will take some substrate and convert it into product and make you aware that you should feel a certain amount of pain. However, there are times when the COX-2 enzyme goes a little bit haywire and it basically causes too much uh, sensation of pain. It makes too, mu too much of the product and that basically makes people feel like they are in too much pain. Well, there you could imagine a situation where you want to uh, prevent the COX-2 enzyme from making so much product. And if you could slow it down or stop it from making so much product, uh, whoever was feeling pain could, uh, if you could basically turn down their COX-2 enzyme, you could make them feel less pain. One way of doing that is to have people uh, ingest a small molecule that kind of is shaped like the substrate here. It's not exactly the substrate, but it has a similar shape. Similar enough that whatever molecule is ingested, it might fit snugly into this active site as well. And if it's sitting, if the molecule that you ingest is sitting in this active site, this active site can no longer snugly attach to the substrate. And if it can't attach to the substrate, it cannot convert the substrate into product. And if it can't convert the substrate into product, it is not going to, uh, it's going to reduce the sensation of pain in the person. Person, assuming that they ingest whatever that small molecule was that fits into this spot as well. That type of small molecule is called an enzyme inhibitor. And if you had an enzyme inhibitor that inhibited the COX-2 enzyme in particular, then that enzyme inhibitor would relieve a certain amount of pain in people who are feeling uh, too much pain. And those types of molecules do exist. Um, ibuprofen is an example of uh, a medicine that we take that is an inhibitor of the COX-2 enzyme. The ibuprofen molecule uh, molecules actually sort of embed themselves. They sit there in this little active site for COX-2 and they prevent the normal substrate from attaching and because of that the ibuprofen molecules reduce pain. The same is true for aspirin. Aspirin is also a COX-2 inhibitor. Same is true for Celebrex um, as well as Vioxx, although Vioxx has been taken off of the market because it also uh, seems to increase the likelihood of heart attacks. But these are, these are all examples of medicines that work by behaving as enzyme inhibitors. Now, there are, so an enzyme inhibitor is some molecule that prevents an enzyme from catalyzing its reaction, or at least slows it down. There are two types of enzyme inhibitors. There are uh, what are called competitive inhibitors, and there are non-competitive inhibitors. Competitive inhibitors are basically what I just described to you. Um, imagine if you take an ibuprofen molecule 
or you ingest ibuprofen, some of the ibuprofen molecules sit there and they attach to the active site of the COX-2 enzyme and they stop the substrate from attaching there as well. What they are doing, what the ibuprofen molecules are doing is they're competing with whatever normally attaches there and they're competing with it and if you take enough of them they can outcompete whatever normally attaches there and so they're called competitive inhibitors. Um, Non-competitive inhibitors uh, basically do something a little bit different. What non-competitive inhibitors do is those molecules attach to some other part of the enzyme. Imagine that you took a different uh, medicine and this medicine attached to a completely different part of the enzyme, let's say over here, that was not part of the active site. But even though they're attaching at some place else entirely, they distort the shape of the enzyme so much that they end up distorting the shape of the active site anyway. And if they distort the shape of the active site, then this thing can no longer fit snugly into the distorted active site and the enzyme still can't convert the substrate into products. So if you if you have an inhibitor that attaches somewhere else other than the active site, it's called a non-competitive inhibitor. If you have an inhibitor that attaches to the active site and directly competes with the substrate for who can attach to the active site, then it's a competitive inhibitor. And I have two short videos that basically show in cartoon fashion the difference between a competitive and a non-competitive inhibitor. And they're going to be shown next. During the normal enzyme catalytic cycle, the substrate encounters an enzyme with a specific active site to which it binds, forming an enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme then facilitates the breakdown of the substrate to its products, which part from the enzyme, leaving the active site free to catalyze another substrate as the cycle begins again. Competitive inhibition occurs when an enzyme encounters a blocker, which mimics the properties of the substrate and binds to the enzyme's active site. Thus, when the substrate is encountered, the active site is not available for attachment and no reaction will occur. Non-competitive enzyme inhibition involves the binding of a blocker to the enzyme away from the active site. This binding causes a conformational change in the enzyme, altering the shape of the active site, which prevents the substrate from binding. No reaction will occur as long as a non-competitive blocker is bound to the enzyme. So that is uh, enzyme inhibition in a nutshell. Um, pretty much every modern medicine that I can think of uh, works in this way, it, um, it, at least in part. So as, as an example, I was talking about ibuprofen and Celebrex and, and aspirin. They are all competitive inhibitors of one particular enzyme that is involved in making products that make us feel pain. Uh, Crixivan is a different medication. You probably have never heard of it. It's not used very much anymore, but it uh, is an anti-HIV medication that is a non-competitive enzyme inhibitor. But as I said, many, if not most, if not, if not all modern medicines that I can think of work as enzyme inhibitors in one way or another. Um, so that, that's enzyme inhibition. That's the end of this unit, this unit on proteins. I want to summarize what you should know for the quiz and for the upcoming final exam as far as these chapters are concerned. Um, as far as proteins are concerned, you should know the general features. In other words, the chemical structure of the amino acids. You should be able to pick out the amine group, the carboxylic acid group, the side chains, uh, the central carbon. You should be able to recognize different amino acid side chains. This does not mean that you should memorize them. In fact, it, it, I think it's a waste of time to memorize them. But if you are given a, a list of amino acids and their structures, you should be able to, to read that list and be able to sort of um, understand what is being shown to you. You should know what an enzyme is. It's a biological molecule that catalyzes chemical reaction. You should know what denaturation is. That's the unfolding of a protein from its normal functional three-dimensional state. Uh, you should know what a temperature optimum and a pH optimum are. Um, those are basically the, the temperature and pH that a particular enzyme works best at. Um, you should know what the difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Uh, you should know the, the levels of protein structure. In particular, I want you to know what primary structure is and what tertiary structure is. I would not worry about secondary and quaternary structure. 
you should know um, that there are different classes of amino acid side chains. There are hydrophobic amino acids, there are hydrophilic amino acids, and you can break the hydrophilic ones into hydrophilic amino acids that are uncharged and hydrophilic amino acids that are charged. Uh, you should know which types of amino acids tend to be found on the surface of a protein. Those are the hydrophilic ones. You should know which types of amino acids tend to be found on the interior of a protein. Those are the hydrophobic ones. Um, a few other things, know what an active site of an enzyme is, know what substrate means, and that's it. So that is the final uh, video lecture. Um, good luck on the quiz, good luck on the final exam, and I will have uh, an announcement about the final, uh, if not today, um, at some point this week.